So this is a special day. Today we will pray different prayers than usual. We will pray and sing with gusto hymns glorifying the Holy Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost. We will dress up the church and ourselves in the kind of obnoxious red that we usually save for Saturdays in the autumn. <laughs> Today is Pentecost. It's the Feast of the Holy Spirit. It is the day we celebrate the presence of God's Spirit in the church and in our lives, and this is your church's special day. It's a common critique of Episcopalians that we are not well attuned to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the theological underpinning of that old joke that Episcopalians are the frozen chosen. <laughs> When Christians from different church communities try to shorthand who they are, there are many who will identify themselves as particularly welcoming of the Holy Spirit in their churches. They might describe their church communities as charismatic, which means gifted, gifted by the Holy Spirit. Or they might call themselves Pentecostal after this day. Or they might affirm that they are spirit-filled. When folks make such claims about their communities, it's a, usually a not too subtle critique of the communities of others. <laughs> Obviously, when a person or a denomination tries to distinguish its uniqueness by saying, we are charismatic, part of what is being said is that some others are not. Now, if true, that would be a real problem. Because the third person of our one triune God the Holy Spirit is part and parcel of the Father and of the Son. So truly, you can't have one without the other. A spiritless church would be no church at all. Of course, no church community or denomination can be all things to all people. We do have our differences, unique strengths and weaknesses, everyone, and we can thank God for that. It seems to be part of God's plan for the church that we are differently gifted parts of the same beautiful, wonderful body. But our differences of worship style and language and music and even theology, meaningful though they are, do not include among them Christian communities both with and without the Spirit. The Spirit is present and manifest in every Christian community throughout the world, including the one that is assembled here in Bellevue at this address this morning. There is ample and wonderful evidence of the Spirit's presence in your midst here at the Church of the Holy Spirit. I would venture in the enthusiasm and the creativity and the joy that is so often and dependably a part of your shared experience of being church here in this place. Luke writes about this kind of thing in the story we read from the book of Acts this morning. In that tale that we just heard, the Holy Spirit visibly descends upon the disciples, filling them with new energy and new power. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, the story says, and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. If the exact nature of what happened that day is a little tough to pin down, and after all, there's some confusion, one group of eyewitnesses see God working in a clear and purposeful way in this moment, and another group sees the disciples as getting drunk first thing in the morning. <laughs> but whatever really happened, whatever the whole story was, it was noisy, it was fun, it was different than the usual thing. People were talking and telling stories about God's presence, and God's power, and sharing in the experience of God's presence and God's grace. For the believers present, it all added up to one wonderful thing. The Spirit was with them. Now, haven't you experienced that same kind of joyful delight? And the creative and life-giving energy that happens when God is present as a member and participant of this body 
and in the ministries of this community. I think of the wonderful social events that you all host to bind this community together and welcome friends and neighbors to get a peek of the, at the, of the pure joy that is contained in this church. Bingo nights and wine tastings, soup suppers and foyer groups. I think of the outreach activities that are, are increasingly becoming a part of your identity as a church family. The mobile food pantry, 10,000 pounds of food you shared with a hungry people yesterday. The diocesan youth mission trip to the reservation that Father Tom and Sharon have led for us for like a decade. The Journey's youth works at making blankets and collecting toiletries. I think of your exchange of the peace, which wherever it happens in your service, I have to tell you, is among the warmest and most exuberant exchanges of the peace in the whole Diocese of Nebraska. <laughs> that is a moment when something very special happens in this community. I think it's more than friends saying hi to one another on a Sunday morning. Your exchange of the peace conveys to those present a sense of joy and life abundant that is about your common life in Christ and your determination to truly welcome even an utter stranger who happens to be in your midst. When the witnesses of that first Pentecost describe what they see and hear, they are in agreement that Jesus followers were a noisy, joy-taking, good news-sharing bunch of people. And I want to say that from where I stand, that sounds a lot like all of you. And it is perfect proof of the Spirit in your midst. Now, if you agree with me that the Spirit is really and truly here with you, then I think it's important to notice one other thing about today's story. And it's a connection with your here and now at the Church of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> in this morning's tale, part of the miracle of that first Pentecost is the fact that the disciples can suddenly all speak in new languages. And they quickly do so, sharing the story of Jesus and speaking about God's deeds of power. I believe that's a beautiful and helpful image of work that we are all invited to as present-day followers of Jesus and the latest generation of disciples to be blessed by the presence of the Spirit. Like the women and the men in this morning's story, we're invited to learn to speak the language of the neighbors who surround us so that we too can say and show in our own ways and in our own time the story of God's presence and God's deeds of power, telling all those who have ears to hear about how deeply we know that we are cherished and loved by Jesus. When I was 18 years old, I went off to college 1,300 miles away in Connecticut. What started off as an exciting fall and a great adventure soon turned very difficult for as I found myself struggling to keep up academically and more than a little bit on the outs socially and most of all, just painfully homesick for Omaha and the family who had been my life up to then. When Thanksgiving rolled around, though it was expensive and not part of the family budget that we had mapped out ahead of time, I talked my parents into letting me fly home for the long holiday weekend. I will never forget a conversation I had with Bop that week. Bop was my mom's dad and a true patriarch of our family. He was an old school, all business, nose to the grindstone, traditional values kind of a grandpa. And I absolutely loved him. So during that Thanksgiving break, I went over to Bop's house and in a moment of uncharacteristic honesty and vulnerability, I told Bop the whole story of my college experience so far. I told him how freaked out I was about school 
and how snotty and weird all my preppy classmates were, <laughs> and how I missed home every single day. It was a sign of my desperation that I told him all that. And if I am honest, I fully expected to get a lecture about not soiling the family name and not blowing my big chance and how nothing worthwhile ever happened without a whole ton of work. But instead of that, when I finished my story, Bob looked right through me with those wise old eyes of his and he said, Scotter, you need to decide for yourself what to do here. All we want for you is to be happy in life. And if you decide to come home and become a taxi cab driver, then we'll be behind you 100%. That was a moment of incredible grace in my life. And you see, I guarantee you that deep down, that was not the whole story as far as Bob was concerned. I am sure that he would have been none too thrilled if I had dropped out of college my freshman year and come home to Nebraska to drive a cab. But what I believe is that he saw what I really needed in that moment, and he found the words to say the right thing. He spoke the language that I needed to hear rather than what would have necessarily been the easy or normal or tempting thing for him to say. And funny enough, getting permission from Bob, of all people, to drop out of college and come home gave me the confidence somehow to go back to school after Thanksgiving and stick with the program and ultimately find my way as a college student Just like those earliest apostles, we are invited to learn to speak the language of the neighbors who surround us. To show, so that we can say and show in our own way, in our own time, the story of God's present day deeds of power. The story of how deeply we know we are cherished by Jesus. My hope for you, my brothers and sisters, on this Pentecost Day is that you can remember that you and this parish church are just full of God's Holy Spirit. In this place and among this company of people, you are surrounded by proofs of that same Spirit's presence and power in all your lives. Take joy in that truth. Love and care for one another in that same spirit of enthusiasm and creativity and joy that characterized the lives of Jesus' very first followers on that first Pentecost day. And with the help of each gifted member of this community, take your experience of being cherished in this place and from within these four walls out into the wider world by learning to speak the language of all your neighbors so that they, too, might come to know the joy of God's love and the power of the Spirit. Amen. Amen.